this picture of Jesus. Nobody knows the power of God, what he's intending to do in a person's life. Welcome to Crosstalk International. I'm Josh Weiss, and if you've missed the last few episodes, we've been walking through the Passover Seder. You might say, what's a Passover Seder? Well, I encourage you to go to the website, crosstalk.org or randyweiss.com, and check out a Passover backstory. You can actually uh, be preemptive and go to the website right now and go download the PDF copy of this book, which walks through a Passover Seder. We started the last episode walking through the Passover Seder itself, and we're gonna conclude that Passover Seder today. And so without any further ado, I wanna jump right in. Oh my gosh, dinner rolls, we're gonna be excommunicated. Are Easter Bunny's kosher? Jesus Christ, who forgot the matzah? Wait a separate check, please. Passover is a night of fours. We recite the four questions. We drink four cups. We spoke of four famous sons. Many modern satyrs include a section for fifth child. And unlike the four sons we discuss, it could be a son or a daughter. I'm going to let my dad explain this to you because I think you'll find it impactful. Many modern satyrs include a section for a fifth child. Unlike the four sons we discussed, this child could be a son or a daughter. And to this fifth child, it is unimportant whether they were wise, simple, and different, or not knowing enough about our traditions to ask an informed question. And I'll ask you to read this with me, if you would, where it says all. We choose to remember the fifth child, the one who did not survive to ask in memory of those Jewish boys and girls who died in the Holocaust, we stop to honor their memory and we point toward mankind's only real hope. We wait for our Messiah. We must also remember those Jewish children being slaughtered through the horror of abortion. You won't find this in most Haggadahs or most Seders, but um, you're at my Seder. And it's my Haggadah. And so you're going to hear this. Estimates say one-fifth of all pregnancies in Israel end in abortion. Since 1948, more babies have been aborted in Israel than the number of children that died in the Holocaust. Hitler failed to finish their task at slaughtering Jewish infants. I'm thankful that Yad Vashem, which is a Holocaust memorial museum, in Israel, and if you get to Israel, visit Yad Vashem, it'll break your heart, but you will certainly learn much. I'm thankful that Yad Vashem helps us to remember the 1,500,000 Jewish children who were murdered in the Holocaust by the Nazis and their collaborators. But we must no longer remain silent about the more than 2 million infant murders that have happened in modern Israel. Let us pray that modern Jewish abortions will come to an end. As of this printing, despite the nation's deeply rooted respect for life, Israel is one of the only countries in the world where it is legal to abort a baby up until birth. Like Pharaoh tried to force Shifra and Pua, remember those two names, Shifra and Pua? Pharaoh tried to force them to abort baby boys at the moment of birth, Many now want to allow the same behavior in America. The divisive trend to promote late-term abortions is staggering. May we stand for the defenseless unborn, and may we pray for an end to the horrific Holocaust happening in the wombs of America and Israel. Let us honor the memory of aborted infants and also pray for the yet unborn. If you are unashamed to make a bold pro-life declaration, Will you join with us and say 
we believe in the sanctity of life and we will speak up boldly for life. May we defend the defenseless unborn. May we use our voices and influence on their behalf because they have neither. May we find ways to assist pregnant women to have their babies, raise their babies, or find godly families to love and adopt these babies. May we help and comfort those women who have suffered the loss of a child in miscarriage or death. May we offer hope through God's love to women who went through an abortion and now grieve. May God grant healing, peace, restoration, fruitfulness, and where needed, forgiveness. May God bless the men, women, and families of those touched by these tragic events. May special blessings be granted to those who value life, motherhood, and adoption. And may God help us understand that being pro-life does not end at birth. The lives of mothers and children who struggle after the moment of delivery also matter. And we will quickly move to discuss the 10 plagues. The next part of the Seder is an interesting tradition that always tests the younger participants. We now recite the 10 plagues where we take our little finger and we dip it in the grape juice. And as we go through each one, we wipe it on a napkin saying the plagues. And we always tell them, don't lick your finger. The little ones struggle with that one. Those 10 plagues, if you don't remember, there's blood, frogs, gnats, flies, pestilence, boils, hail, locust, darkness, and the slaying of the firstborn. Rabbi Gamaliel says that whoever has not done or recited these three things on the Passover night has not fulfilled his Passover duty. What are those three things? They must be retold. Gamaliel's big three are Pesach, Matzah, and bitter herbs. Pesach, Passover, the Passover lamb, which our ancestors ate during the existence of the temple. For what reason was it eaten? Because the omnipresent, blessed be he, passed over the houses of the ancestors of our ancestors in Egypt. As it is said, ye shall say, it is a sacrifice of the Passover unto the Lord, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote Egyptians and spared our houses and the people bowed themselves and worshiped. The second is matzah, unleavened bread. This unleavened bread which we eat during Passover, what does it mean? It is eaten because the dough of our ancestors had not time to become leavened. Before the Supreme King of Kings, the Most Holy, blessed be he, revealed himself unto them and redeemed them. As it is said, they baked unleavened cakes of dough which they had brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they made any provisions for themselves. Judaism and Christianity symbolically relate hametz, leaven, to sin. The Jewish apostle Paul specifically called immorality leaven. He said that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul was concerned that sin would proliferate in the lives of new Christians. He warned believers to purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The third is maror, bitter herbs. This bitter herb, which is what we eat, what does it mean? It's eaten because the Egyptians embittered the lives of our forefathers in Egypt, as it is written, and they made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field, in all their service, wherein they made them serve with rigor. If you grew up in a church like me and my family, you probably learned the Ten Commandments as a kid. I hope you did. It's very easy to stray away from the importance of those commandments. My dad, Sagata, it makes a point to remember the sacred commandments given to us by God in that Exodus story. So, we read them all together. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image. Thou shalt not bow down unto them, nor serve them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And thou shalt not covet. Now we say a prayer and drink the second cup. And the leader reads, This is the word of God as embodied in our Torah. Let us drink the separate cup. And everyone together says, you can learn this prayer, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Bore Pri Hagafen. Blessed art thou, eternal our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Chamoitzi, Moitzi, Matzah. If you've been to church long enough, you know that if you're taking the grape juice, you're also going to be taking the bread. We will now remember the command of the Lord to the children of Israel to eat unleavened bread. We oftentimes will take the bread and we'll break it and we'll recite a special blessing. We can actually, if you've got it with you, you can break it. You'd recite the blessing. Let me read it with you if you would. If, you're, if you have the uh, Passover backstory book, the blessing is Baruch Atah Aranoi. Eloheinu melech haolam, hamoitzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringest forth bread from the earth. The next thing is the bitter herbs. We eat bitter herbs to remind us of our people's afflictions. The Exodus account informs us that the Egyptians made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. The bitter herbs should be chewed and tasted. This helps us to avoid abstractly talking about bitter oppression. Together, we will share a bitter experience during the Passover Seder. Although minuscule in comparison and merely symbolic, let us remember, and as we will taste the bitter herbs, let us feel something to remember. However, we do not want to experience the end without hope. So after reciting the blessing, we will typically mix the maror with our sweet chorosis. We'll eat the bitter and with the sweet. And we want to make sure that we don't, we're not left with only darkness and despair. There's hope. And I hope that we will be reminded of the sweetness of knowing God. But we will also consider those who still suffer in our darkened world. Following this, we would then dip some horseradish into the horosis and say a blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech olam asher kedeshanu v'mitzvotah v'tzivanu al achilat maror. Amen. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has hallowed us with thy commandments and has commanded us concerning the eating of the bitter herbs. Our sweet horosis did not eradicate the taste of bitter herbs but I hope it gave sweetness to add hope for the future. If we walk with the spirit of grace in our life, we can reflect the love of God and express his mercy. If we know God's mercy, we should work to temper human suffering and provide hope. Every child of God can find reason for hope. Each of us can add kindness. We can all prayerfully stand with those who suffer, even when it gets a little messy. Like dipping maror into horosis. Tradition adds one more custom. In honor of the great teacher, Hillel, head of the rabbinic academy in Jerusalem at the time of the Romans, a heathen asked the rabbi to teach him the entire Torah while he stood on one foot. Hillel said, Do not unto others what you would hate them to do unto you. That is the whole Torah. He told the man, The rest is commentary. Now go and study. On Passover, Hillel precisely followed the instruction about the sanctified lamb. Upon unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat. So he commanded matzah and bitter herbs and ate them together. In remembrance of the temple and Hillel, we then placed the bitter herbs on the matzah in place of the Paschal lamb. At this point in the Passover Seder is when everybody enjoys dinner. That's right. The next part of the Seder is my personal favorite. It's the time in our Passover celebration when we join in eating the Passover meal. If you're at my house, 
then we'd be gearing up for some a steaming vat of Mama Weiss's matzo ball soup. But for now, as a minimum, we'll show others eating a traditional Seder substitute, the Chagiga. The egg represents one of the typical festival sacrifices eaten during the celebration. We dip the beitza, or the egg, in the salt water. Salt water reminds us of the tears shed by our forefathers while living as slaves in Egypt. Taskmasters embittered our lives, but God has brought us into the place of freedom to remember his love. The egg that we then dip is symbolic of the sacrificial lamb the ancient Jews ate during the Passover meal. So, as we consider the Passover lamb, we think of Jesus, our Redeemer. For us, he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Our Messiah lives, and he's the reason for our hope. We will give thanks for our food, but not until after we've eaten dinner. This will surprise some Christians, but as Jews, we find that among the many blessings that we recite in the fulfillment of our religious duties, the only ones that Scripture explicitly required us to say are those that we say after we eat. And the Talmud tells us that a blessing for food was first spoken by Moses when God gave us our bread from heaven and Moses gave thanks for God's manna. And now is when we get to the point in the Seder where we go back to the Afikoman. The leader comes back to the table and he finds that there's half of the Afikoman missing. The leader must find the hidden missing half of the broken middle matzah or redeem it through a negotiation of sorts with the child who hid it. The pieces needed for the Seder to continue. Actually, another piece of matzah could probably be used, but uh, reverse blackmail would spoil the fun. <laughs> In our family, the half of the middle matzah is traded for a king-sized candy bar for all of the grandchildren. And at this point in the Seder, the dinner has been eaten and the afikoman has been found. So now it's time to say grace for the food. Why do we say grace after our meal? Well, think of it like this. When people are full without need, they're less dependent on God. But when we're hungry, we want food. When we are full and no longer hungry, we forget to be thankful. There's great danger in our comfort. That is when we can feel self sufficient. Well, God uh, instructed through Moses, when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Moses gave a prudent warning to all of us. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Maybe this is why Jesus said it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wealth brings the danger of pride. Perhaps success brings greater temptation than most of us realize. Saying grace after our meal is intended to protect us against the subtle form of arrogance and pride. Now, let us gather our thoughts and reflect upon the goodness of God and give thanks for his life-giving provision. As he provided for the children of Israel in the wilderness, God still provides for his children today. We are blessed with many reasons to offer God thanksgiving. As we say grace, we partake in the third cup. Many Christian scholars believe that this was the last cup of wine that Jesus drank at his final Passover, you know, the Last Supper. The prayer, again, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam b'rei pri ha'agafen. Blessed art thou, eternal our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Like several aspects of the Seder, my family chooses to go beyond the norm and give honor where honor is due. Did you know that the Haggadah used in most Jewish homes ignores half of the population of the slaves who left Egypt? It's true. In addition to not discussing Moses, most Passover seders are silent about the women of the Exodus account. 
I believe the tradition should change. Join me in giving a long overdue shout out to the ladies who helped us secure our freedom from Egypt. Let us remember and give thanks to God for five special women who are heroines of Passover. Without them, the story of our deliverance could not have been written and we would have remained in bondage. And as we do, let us also pray for and honor all of the women at our table. May each of them love God, be wise, be bold, be honorable, and be fruitful. Traditionally, a female in the Seder reads this part, but for obvious reasons, I'll go ahead and read it for you. May we love children like Jochebed, the blessed mother of Moses, who spared the life of her son while risking her own. And may we have faith to release our loved ones into God's care to bring his desires to pass in their lives. May we love our families as Miriam, the sister of Moses, who loved her brothers, her parents, her people, and her God. May we love life like the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. These godly women refused to slaughter innocent baby boys. They disobeyed Pharaoh at their own peril, and they were rewarded by God for their choice to preserve life while others destroyed life at the very moment of birth. May we be sensitive to the leading of God and open our hearts to his will. The daughter of Pharaoh spared the life of Moses. She adopted the special chosen child of God into her own family. May God bless those who adopt and those who have been adopted. Before drinking the fourth cup together, we typically will all pass around the cup and each person pours a little bit of their cup into it. Though we will yet drink the traditional fourth cup to freedom, we must pause here for what has become known as the fifth cup. We have shared three cups together. A fourth is yet to come, but it is time to interject a thought about a different cup. The Talmudists could not decide whether four or five cups of wine were necessary for the Seder, so a fifth cup is poured and left for Elijah. Let us read a portion of the modern prayer together. In silence, we would pass the cup of Elijah, the cup of the final redemption yet to be. We remember our people's return to the land of Israel, and beginning of that redemption, we each fill Elijah's cup with some of our juice. In so doing, let us remember that our redemption is closer than ever before. We're told that Elijah the prophet visits every house where a Seder is being held, so we open the door for Elijah, and also as a symbol of hospitality and friendliness, as a sign that none is shut off from his fellow man, the prophet Malachi foretold this about Elijah, when he said, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers. We would normally sing a song for Elijah here, but I won't bore you with my joyful noise. To summarize, consider four simple facts. In the first century, the world's Jewish population was 4.5 million. By the year 1500, the Jewish population had been crushed down to 1.5 million. In the early part of the mid-20th century, the Jewish population had swelled to 16 million, and then Hitler systematically destroyed 6 million Jews. Now, we would have we would pass a piece of the afikomen to everyone for upcoming communion. Unlike many Jewish seders, as we conclude our evening, we remember the last Passover seder celebrated by Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. This would be an open communion. All believers are welcome to participate, but it's unwise to partake unless you have made peace with the Lord. It's because Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed that we have hope and forgiveness. If you believe that, then this afikomen will be our bread of the sacrament. And as we would drink the traditional fourth cup of wine, this special form of communion will deepen our spiritual union with our Jewish Messiah. First, we pronounce the traditional Hebrew blessing together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam Berei pri hagafen Blessed art thou, eternal our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine, and everyone would take communion before we depart from the Seder. We commit to love one another. Can this night 
have brought with it a crack in our shell? The question is asked every year at each Seder, why is this night different from all others? Can we answer that question with an affirmation? Can we declare that from this night forward, my life will be different tonight and then again tomorrow and then in every day to come? Can we say, I will serve God and love his children? If we cannot, then this night is not different from all other nights. If we cannot, then this night is one more night of powerless, empty religion. We're called by God to be his witnesses, to announce the kingdom he ushers into this world. Every year, my dad likes to ask his own four questions. You see, I believe that we can live better, we can love better, and if we're more reflective, we can better reflect God's love. So those four questions he asks, who will I keep out? Who will I ignore? Who will I mistreat? And to whom will I present a false gospel that suggests Jesus loves you, but I don't really have the time? May we all have time for God and his purposes. Remember, history is his story. And it is in such a historical context that we would close our Seder. We will recite an ancient Jewish prayer generally attributed to Rabbi Akiva, who died during the Second Jewish Revolt against Rome in approximately 135 CE. It was then that Jerusalem was completely annihilated, and the Jews exiled from our holy city. Rabbi Akiva prayed in faith that Jerusalem would someday be free from foreign rule. And with messianic hope at Passover, he prayed that we would live to celebrate our next Passover in Jerusalem with only three words. It may be the shortest prayer ever added to a liturgy. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And to that, may we declare with Jews around the world, Lashana Haba'ah Barushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. And with that, this concludes the nine-part series on Passover. Passover is such an important festival. It's the festival of unleavened bread. It's such an important element. You know that Jesus celebrated it at this point. We, we participate in the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. There's so many things, so much meat and so much uh, just great information you can get in studying the Passover. I want to encourage you, if you miss any of these nine episodes, you can always find the episodes online. You can find us uh, at the website, crosstalk.org. You can look us online, YouTube. We've got a channel there. Just search the social media platforms at Crosstalk TV is what you would be looking for. You can go to randyweiss.com and download a copy of the book, A Passover Backstory, which is what a lot of these episodes have been coming from. And uh, I just encourage you, let us know that you're out there. Tell us you're enjoying them. Maybe send us some pictures or post some pictures and tag us on them of your own Passover seders. And uh, we hope that you'll just not stay a stranger. You can call us at 1-800-688-3422. You can reach us on the website, social media, address on the screen. Whatever way it works to, for you to communicate with us, please, please, please do communicate. And until next time, shalom and God bless.